Украине. То, во что это вылилось, уже смело можно называть не лукавя, Третьей мировой войной. Совершенно точно. Мы прямо сейчас сражаемся, если не с НАТО, то уж точно с инфраструктурой НАТО. И это тоже надо... If he really wants to deter NATO involvement and he believes that he can shatter NATO, then he would perhaps use a low yield nuclear weapon. Where would he use it? Probably not in Ukraine, but perhaps on the staging areas or some populated area in Poland. This is what's usually done in the Russian exercises. Getting in some breaking news now, Poland's government uh, has issued a guide that instructs public how to prepare for a crisis like war and what to do from uh, during attacks with the weapons ranging from conventional to chemical and nuclear. Но даже то, что есть посягательство на нашу территорию, когда вы говорите про войну, вы имеете в виду объявление мобилизации тотальной? Стоп! Здесь думать нечего. Здесь нужен ответ. Moving on, Russia warned on Thursday that if Sweden and Finland join NATO, then Russia would deploy nuclear weapons and hypersonic missiles in the heart of Europe. But what if one day Taiwan does come under a PLA attack? On Tuesday, the government released an online handbook on what civilians should do in the event of a war. Hi folks, Canadian Prepper here. This thing is about to go to the next level. So we're going to discuss some stories that have come out in the last 24 hours. Let's just get right to it. Okay, so a two-page verbal statement was sent out to the State Department by the Russian Embassy in Washington. Russian warns Washington for the first time of unforeseen consequences if it continues to equip Ukraine. This development, of course, comes after the loss of the Russian cruiser Moskva. If you want to know where this is from, this is from a Greek news source, which seems to be really uh, ahead of the curve when it comes to their reporting on this issue. According to Russian media, Putin was informed overnight about the loss of the ship and was furious in a way we have never seen him before, in quotes, Russian sources said. According to the same information, the Russian officials told him that the Russian cruise missile, the Ukrainian anti-ship missile Neptune, this is what they're saying, did not hit noting that the attack was made with NATO weapons photographing the British behind the attack harpoon. I don't know what that is. Okay, so uh, really what, obviously the Russians are denying that it was hit. Now, I think the gist of what they're saying here, however, is that the Russians are really starting to realize, not so much realize because they've known this all along, that they're not fighting just the Ukrainian military. They're fighting NATO, okay? And... That is one of the reasons why this thing is taking so long. Because they're not just fighting Ukraine, they're fighting NATO. And uh, Russia has warned the United States that there will be unforeseen consequences if Washington continues to supply arms to Ukraine, the Washington Post reported today. Now, this is getting serious. Now, listen to this. So Putin has a dilemma right now, okay? Um, either he can go to war and cause a general mobilization to put the economy in a state of war mobilization, okay, which is going to basically bring the full force of the Russian military to bear, at least what they can spare, because remember, they got this massive border that they need to enforce. And they just sold India some Russian S-400 missile defense systems, which uh, should be an indication also of the fact that they clearly have enough of these things to go around if they're still selling them during this war. So this is why I don't believe the line that Russian is running out of stuff. I, I just can't believe that. If they're 
literally sending India one of their best missile defense systems as we speak. Now, because of that, though, that might rub China the wrong way. But we really don't know how that love triangle is working right now. Um, we're just going to have to wait and see. So the, according to this article, they and this is what I've heard from some people. However, you're going to hear mixed opinions about this. Uh, Putin cannot face NATO in a conventional war. I would say they probably couldn't face NATO with, if you include the US. If you're just talking about Europe, then yeah, they probably could. But uh, if you're just if you're talking about U.S. involved in NATO, then I would probably lean towards agreeing with this. But I don't know enough about it to be absolutely sure. Putin cannot face NATO in a conventional war. The inexhaustible flow of ammunition from the collective west of Ukraine has resulted in horrific losses to the Russian army. He is therefore faced with those two options, like we just mentioned. Now, as we know, Russia has. 2,000 tactical nuclear warheads that they could deploy at the drop of a hat. And that video footage that I showed you early in the montage appears to show those uh, launching systems being moved towards the uh, eastern part of Ukraine. Uh, so very, very serious stuff. Now, apparently, take this for what it's worth, the Russian aircraft of the apocalypse is in the air. Immediately after the strike, the Moskva cruiser received a large amount of Russian uh, air activity. You're going to have to forgive me. This is a translated article. Sources say that the biggest air mobilization took place since the beginning of the Russian-Ukraine war. The Tupolev Tu-214SR command aircraft or Apocalypse, air Apocalypse aircraft was also in the air. This is a modified version of the Tu-214. Is a Russian so-called Apocalypse plane. It is equipped to provide the Russian leadership with a mobile command and control center in the event of a major flood <laughs> or war. I wonder why they chose flood. Four built-in generators provide ample power while a set of external fuel tanks allow the aircraft to remain in the air for 10,000 kilometers. Um, they also go into great depth about, you know, the different types of aircraft that were in the air. Now, in terms of how the Russian population is reacting to this, this is very important because we're likely going to see a mass mobilization now. They're likely going to turn the heat up a notch. They've already targeted Kiev with strikes. Uh, by the time this video is released, that may have intensified, it's hard to say. Uh, they're likely going to start to target Odessa or wherever those missiles came from that took out the cruiser in or supposedly took out the cruiser. Now, either way, okay, let, just going back a bit, uh, whether it was taken out or whether it was incompetence and somebody, you know, accidentally lit a fire that blew up an ammunition stash or whatever the case, it was incompetence. So uh, either way, it doesn't look good for the Russians. And, uh, you know, and that's something that needs to be admitted now. In terms of what it means to the Russian Navy, apparently it was an older ship. Um, they have a, a ton of destroyers and uh, frigates and corvées and a, a variety, a huge Navy, you know, so not as huge as the United States, of course, but they have a very sizable Navy. So uh, while it's uh, a big sort of blow to Russian morale, uh, it actually could have the opposite effect. This could mobilize the entire population for war. And uh, it almost makes me wonder, you know, maybe it was a bit of a, a false flag. You know, it, it could have been because, anyways, it's hard to say. Let's not go there. Um, now, Russian state-sponsored media, you've seen some of those clips at the beginning. And uh, we're, we're just going to kind of go over a little bit about what was said there because it's very, very important to understand how the psyche, or at least uh, the psyche according to Russian state-sponsored media, is transforming. Now, we know that 80% of people in Russia, at least the, to the best of our understanding, is in support of this thing. So take that for what it's worth. Now, Russian experts and analysts stress that the term special military operation should cease to exist and uh, that we, they need to declare a full-scale war. A full-scale war, okay? Ask why the special operation in Ukraine lasts so long. Russian state television presenter Olga Skabiva stressed that Russia is fighting World War III against NATO and that it's not fighting the Ukraine. Now, you have to understand, and I mean, she does kind of have a point, okay? this If they were just fighting the Ukraine, this probably would have been over a long time ago. But because you're having arms resupply because you're having intelligence because you're having um 
the whole propaganda campaign and the world behind and you're having mercenaries go there. So you're essentially having, you know, mercenaries from NATO countries using NATO weapons, utilizing full spectrum NATO intelligence to fight the Russians in Ukraine. So, I mean, you know, she's not totally wrong. She's not right either, but it's something to bear in mind. If you're trying to be realistic and looking at what's going on here, you have to keep that in mind. Many are wondering, could it not have been done faster? Everybody wants the military operation to be completed faster. Everybody wants the final victory. This is one of the TV hosts saying this. Um, everyone wants the goals completed. One could say that it has escalated into World War III. This is true. We are currently fighting against NATO infrastructure, if not against NATO itself. We must recognize this. The war being waged by NATO, they want a full-scale war. Now, according to the CIA, <laughs> what are they really going to tell us, right? Um, you know, on the one hand, I can I can sympathize with the CIA and, and some of the things they do in terms of maintaining, you know, secrecy at the, at the highest level for national security. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, some of the things that we've heard about what they've done, you know, are seemingly evil to say the least however even that said we don't really know how the game is played at the absolute top you know i mean look you could you could make lots of rational arguments when it comes to national security every which way from sunday but that said they're saying that they don't think that the russians are currently posturing in a nuclear way in a way which is irregular okay so and that that could mean a variety of things, however. That could be for the purpose of uh, creating calm. Um, that could serve the interest of, you know, the military-industrial complex to make us more compelled to get involved in the war if we don't think that it's going to go nuclear. Uh, it could just be, you know, like, yeah, maintaining, uh, minimizing public panic. It could serve that purpose. It's really hard to say what the motive of coming out with that is, or it's just to pretend, play pretend like they don't know what's going on. Uh, it's really hard to say. Uh, but they're saying that they don't think that the threat is elevated when everything else really appears to speak to the contrary. And then when you have Russian state television now saying that this is, you know, we need to step it up in a very aggressive fashion. And I pay attention to it because you got to see what the other side is thinking, right? And uh, they've amped it up a lot as a result of this. So this may well have the opposite effect. And with the supposed incursions onto Russian territory uh, by Ukrainian forces, uh, I don't know. I mean, that's that they're claiming. The Ukrainians are denying that they're doing this. So that could be false flag. Who knows? But with all that combined, we know that um, it's not good because... That means that uh, this thing is, is going to intensify. You see all those, this buildup of uh, the military in the east. They're starting to target Kiev again. So it's likely that they're going to become more, more indiscriminate. I mean, if you were to put them on trial for war crimes right now, I mean, what, what incentive would they have? And this is the problem. I'm not saying they haven't done that or anything like that. Uh, I'm just saying that, you know, it becomes very hard to de-escalate the situation if you're already accused of committing a crime and you're already charged for the crime and prosecuted for the crime you know it, it doesn't you might as well just keep going you know what i mean so that's the scary part with all this and i know a lot of people think that this should just happen right away because we've been so conditioned by video games and the media to think yeah you should just be able to mobilize hundreds of thousands of troops overnight but these things can take months okay battles can take months if not years to prepare and uh you know it, it's it you, you cannot you have to remember this is a marathon this is not a sprint and if you don't want to pay attention to this stuff i don't blame you go and do something else live your life i'm sure when the disaster finally hits you know it'll be undeniable and it'll be on every uh, mainstream media news network and then you can you know take an interest but if you want to be ahead of the curve and you want to know what's going on then i guess watch this channel okay so what else do we got in the news here so nato reveals new European nuclear plan. So U.S. nuclear bombs shared with nuclear allies will be deployed on Lockheed Martin jets. I believe that's the F-35. So NATO planners are updating the U.S. nuclear sharing program to account for most 
European allies planning to buy F-35 Joint Strike fighter jets. And boy, do they have a lot of orders right now. I don't even know how they're going to meet all these orders because it takes so long to build these things. Lockheed Martin's fifth generation fighter has been embraced by multiple U.S. allies, including most recently Germany, despite the Pentagon's own misgivings about the program. Now think about that. Giving Germany S30, F-35s, and uh, you know Germany could basically, if they wanted to, start building nukes overnight. You know, we're not a far cry from the U.S. basically letting Germany go because it is an occupied territory just like Japan. you got to remember that at all times. And uh, there's definitely some puppeteering going on there as well, which is why Germany is between a rock and a hard place because on the one hand, they need that Russian gas, but on the other hand, they're being pushed, I think, into, you know, putting up a fight or at least that's with the whole helmet fiasco, wanting to send helmets and, you know, they, they give, give a little nudge uh, by old Joe, Sleepy Joe. And then, of course, all of a sudden they're sending more uh, heavy armaments and possibly even heavy weapons. Uh, we're moving fast and furiously towards F-35 modernization and incorporating into our planning and our exercising and things with like those capabilities are coming online, according to Jess Jessica Cox, director of the NATO Nuclear Policy Directorate in Brussels. Uh, and if you haven't watched our video yet with Jay Block, he talks, he goes into great depth, obviously nothing classified about how the nuclear weapons program works with NATO and the United States and what our capabilities are. Go check that video out. So uh, I think, what was it, Norway who wanted to buy like 60 F-35s. Yeah, Finland and Sweden have recently voiced a desire to join NATO in Helsinki. Finland recently announced it would buy some 60 F-35s in February. We just got F-35s sitting around, right? Jeez. So things are uh, not a laughing matter at all. Now, NATO warships have arrived to the Baltic Sea. Now, if you've been paying attention to this channel, you know that the, the town of Kaliningrad, or the town, it's like... Uh, what would you call it, uh, satellite state of Russia, which is removed from the, the mainland and is right on the coast of the Baltic Sea. Many people think that there's already nuclear weapons there. Uh, there's been war gaming on state media sponsored television in Russia about how they would uh, wage an offensive there by utilizing radar jamming devices and basically um, taking over Finland and Sweden, or at least attempting to. I mean, I think it's a lot easier said than done, but a lot of it involves <clears throat> creating a no-fly zone on the islands within the Baltic Sea by uh, secretly deploying S-400 missile defense systems or F-500 uh, missile defense systems, which I believe are more tailored towards taking out space. And that's a that's something a lot of people are, are forgetting about. And you're not hearing a lot about that in the media, but the capability of the Russians to shoot down satellites from the ground. Okay, that's a pretty significant capability. They have that capability with the S-500, S-550 uh, missile defense systems, which is uh, something that looks like it's out of a sci-fi movie. Uh, go and check that out if you haven't seen that yet. So <laughs> they're currently doing exercises in the region. Now, anytime I hear that they're doing military exercises at this stage in the game, you, you got to, you know, use your critical thinking skills. <laughs> That's really pretty much newspeak for they're getting ready for something or they're putting themselves in a defensive position. I don't think it has much to do with, um, with um, what they're saying it is. Now, I got uh, a few other messages here, uh, besides the war thing, which is, is very significant, guys. Uh, I know, like I said, a lot of people are getting burnt out by the topic, but you need to understand that these things move slow, but it is moving and it is progressing. And none of your preps, and the thing with prepping and survival and any sort of uh, financial investments you make with it, so long as you, you don't make a stupid investment in like... 30 years worth of freeze-dried food which tastes disgusting like there's freeze-dried food out there that tastes great and i can eat it every day and i do eat it every day but there's also uh lots of scammer companies out there who are selling people stuff that they hope they never eat because if they ate it they would realize how disgusting it was and then they write bad reviews about it they know that most people are just going to store this shit in their closet okay um 
but survival gear in itself, most of it, as long as it's not tech based, as long as it doesn't have a chip in it, usually, and even some of that is all right too, uh, usually will hold its value and retain its value for years, if not decades. I mean, a, a K bar knife that you got in Vietnam in the 60s and 70s, so long as it's, you know, not gaining any rust or corrosion or anything like that, is still a K bar knife that is a capable knife, you know? So, these things don't lose their value typically because they're built for rugged survival situations. Now, the reason why I say that is because, you know, there's a lot of people who are, you know, they're like, oh, when is SHTF going to happen? Look, we hope it never happens. That's the thing. If you are upset that it didn't happen, it's like, it would be like buying insurance and then getting mad because your house didn't burn down because you couldn't use the insurance. That's exactly what it would be like. Or, you know, um, your spouse not dying so you, you didn't get the uh, insurance money back. Like, come on, guys. Like, just you have to be an adult about these things. So I have a few personal emails here just uh, to attest to the video that I recently made about the coming potential food shortages and I've made a lot of videos about that, obviously, but this phone call I received in the most recent video was very, very significant. And I'm not sure if I communicated it effectively, but basically what you need to know is that this distributor of freeze-dried food, and no, it's not the same as dehydrated food, and there's a reason why I don't want to explain it. Someone's like, why don't you explain what it is? Do you think we're too stupid to understand? No, because I can't just break off into 50,000 tangents off of every little topic that I jump into. Otherwise, these videos would be 50 minutes long. I've made countless videos about what freeze-dried food is. Please go watch it if you want to put down the bong for a second. You know who I'm talking about. And uh, <laughs> anyways, okay, so... Yeah, what were we talking about again? Okay, so the the main uh, point of that conversation was that 90%, okay, there's going to see a 90% reduction in the amount of inventory available. This means that we're not getting inventory from these companies. And what that means is that the surplus is gone. That means that the, the surplus that we've enjoyed, this is not saying that the grocery stores are going to be empty per se. It's going to mean that the price is going to skyrocket. But what it means is that the time to prep is over. If that's not a signal that the time to prep is over, that the, the ability to buy preps is no more because the stuff isn't being made or the stuff isn't abundant enough to have a surplus that emergency food supply companies can actually uh, have it make it affordable to get because you see uh, most of this freeze-dried food it costs a lot of money because it's an energy intensive process it's not just you know letting your tomatoes out to dry type thing like a dehydrator it's a very very energy intensive process there's the packaging there's all the you know certifications you have to go through so you can only do it in a market i mean you can do it but it's going to be so unaffordable for people only the super rich are going to be able to afford it and uh, they're just not enough, as, as much as there's a lot of rich people, there's not enough to be able to f fund, keep the industry going and keep them in business. They need to make it a manageable price so that enough people can buy it so that they can keep their business going. So when it gets so expensive that they can't make food, that's a sign. That's a sign that the surplus is gone. That means we're getting down to... Uh, just what's the word I'm looking for? That means we're starting to dip into our our, our actual rations. Okay, that means we're starting to uh, go run into deficit territory, caloric deficit territory on a national level. Um, anyways, I'll just read some of these emails. Um, Hi, my name is blah blah blah. I've studied emergency management in college and work currently in nuclear security and nuclear firefighting. I've been following you for some time. I thought I should give you more evidence for the talk about grain prices. I'm close friends with someone who provides legal counseling for one or more um, largest grain conglomerates in Canada. I asked about food shortages in the future. The store product from last harvest was awful, so prices will surge to fill future-based contracts, and I can guarantee that's true because all across Canada last year in the growing seasons, it was either smoke, floods or drought so yeah the crops were very low 
They will already be selling new crops, so if the weather doesn't cooperate, it's going to be a problem. This is directly from a personal trusted source. Take the info as you need. Again, guys, people wonder why I don't give up my sources. For starters, um, yeah, I mean, I don't expect you to take what I say at face value. I don't ex I expect you to uh, go by the results of what I say. Now, some people say my predictions have been wrong, but if you actually go back and, and look over the past few years, uh, the majority of my predictions do come true. And they're not really my predictions. They're just uh, looking slightly around the corner a few weeks ahead. And sure enough, these things happen. Now, some of them are a bit more long game. And yeah, we have predicted some things, but I don't expect you to... And the reason why we don't give up the sources, for one, we want to preserve people's anonymity. Um, that's the main thing. And I also want to encourage more people to send me this information. And yeah, that's that's the gist of it. It's basically just me wanting to protect, you know, people's anonymity. But I can totally understand if you're critical of it. I totally would be critical of it too. Um, just take it for what it's worth, all right? I work at a pre uh concrete firm here in a Canadian province. My job is project coordination and estimate. My job is all about knowing what the prices of every product that goes into the production precast concrete and the installation of the precast elements. I get that I guess that this may not seem important to preparedness or food issues, but many products that we need come through the same supply chains. So you're probably wondering what I'm going to pass on to you that matters in the grand scheme of things. Well, it does in spades. I was informed by my suppliers of powder, Portland cement, and additives that by this September, they will not be shipping any product to firms that do not use a certain amount of product in their business. To understand that uh, basically goes into that if your business isn't big enough, then you're not going to be getting any product. So only the big players are going to get product. Um, then he goes into the process of how to make Portland cement, yada, yada, yada. Uh, it's crazy and we have no idea how deep all of this is going to go soon as each industry starts finding that raw base materials are either in short or non-existent supplies. We will be have. We will be having not hyperinflation, but nothing to buy, but whatever the government decides each gets. Now, the situation going on in China, something is going on and something has to give in that situation. Either they come to terms with the fact that they're going to have to live with that disease or it is going to continue to cause economic havoc around the world. Now, maybe that's part of the strategy. We don't know. Maybe that's part of the starving us out. Maybe that's why they have a year and a half worth of grain stored up. I'm not saying that is the case. I'm just saying we need to understand that this is World War III. Maybe it hasn't gone officially kinetic yet. If you don't know Ray Dalio, the five stages of war were basically, uh, I would say, in the fourth and uh, eventually going to the fifth, which is going to be the hot war. And... You have uh, that whole Nancy Pelosi thing, wanting to visit Taiwan. S surprisingly, she got COVID after uh, China made some threats about, hey, you shouldn't go to Taiwan. That's going to be very bad. And uh, of course, uh, the United States is th threatening sanctions against China if they do anything with Taiwan. And if that were to happen, guys, if they do Taiwan, you think food prices are bad now? You think the market crash is going to get bad? That is where we're going to see a near apocalyptic drop. And it's going to be abrupt. That on top of the Ukraine thing. Like, you know, there's a, a saying in psychology, like you can handle three major life events at once without going into full-blown suicidal depression. Like, you know, you could have someone in your family die. You could uh, lose your job and you could get some sort of major health bad news. And then you would likely just you know, lose it. The same is true for the global economy, okay? So we've had the pandemic, we have all this crazy weather stuff, we have this economy stuff, we have a war with Ukraine. These, like, we're, we're teetering on the edge. One more major event is going to push it over the edge, and it's going to be the abrupt thing that everybody has been conditioned to believe that it's supposed to be in those apocalyptic movies. But the fact of the matter is, usually SHDF is going to be a slow burn. The pandemic showed us that. Two years running. And that was only for, a, you know, conservatively speaking, 1.5% kill rate. Okay? Um, 
and that's just of the people who caught it. So just imagine, just imagine a 5% kill rate. Just imagine another war breaks out in the country that produces all of our stuff and we're fighting with them. Imagine how much the shortages are, are crazy they're going to be. Guys, the shortages are crazy right now. We cannot get any products still because there's this never-ending backlog. And because of what's going on there, it's not going to get better. I've totally run out of film. I hope you guys got some insight from this video. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. If you enjoy the video, Canadian Prepper out.